In our previous video for lecture four, we introduced the idea of the class equation, uh, which gives us a way of measuring the order of a finite group using its conjugacy classes. The, I, I mentioned that this, this class equation is very, very important. And so in this video, I wanna study the idea of P groups uh, and then use the class equation to help us better understand the structure of a P group. Well, what's a P group? Well, in this situation, P is a prime number. It could be two, it could be three, five, any prime number, it doesn't matter. We say that a finite group is a P group if the order of the group is P to the N. Uh, that is the, the order of the group is a power of prime or another way of saying that is that only one prime divides the order of the group. Some examples of that we've seen many, right? Examples of two groups would be like Z4, the Klein four group, D4, Q8, uh, the cyclic group of order four, as the name suggests, as order four, the Klein four group is also an a group of order four. These are examples of abelian two groups because their orders are two to a power. D4 is a, a non-abelian group of order eight. The quaternion group is also a non-abelian group of order eight. These are all examples of two groups. Uh, examples of three groups would be things like Z9 and Z3 cross Z3. So this is the elementary abelian group of order nine. These are three groups. And we can do this, of course, for, for various groups, right? We could take cyclic groups and uh, elementary abelian groups. These are all examples of P groups for their respective orders. It's easy to come up with abelian groups because we have the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. We If we just take direct products of cyclic P groups, that'll give us an abelian P group. Non-abelian P groups are a little bit more difficult to, to come across here. Um, I shouldn't say that. I mean, they're quite ubiquitous, but at this level of our development, it's it's difficult to describe some of these. We'll, we'll get there eventually, of course, but I should give you some non-examples, right? Like S3 is not a P group. Uh, the order of S3 is six, which actually means that both two and three divided, it's not a power of a prime. Many groups are not P groups, but P groups in some respect are the atomic building blocks of other groups in some essence. Uh, I won't say too much about that, but in some regard, they're the simplest of all groups. Uh, not simple in like the group theory sense that, I mean, P groups will have normal subgroups. We'll actually, uh, we'll, we'll kind of get to that in just a second. Uh, but they're, from a conceptually point of view, uh, they're very, very elementary uh, in, in, in comparison to other groups, right? Oftentimes we try to prove things about groups, we go to P groups first, because if we can prove it for P groups, then we can uh, climb the hierarchy of groups, more complicated groups, more complicated groups. P groups are some of the most simple type of groups there are, the most elementary type of groups. But like I said a moment ago, uh, P groups are not simple in the group theory sense. P groups always have non-trivial normal subgroups. Uh, so if G is a P group, it'll have a non-trivial center. That is, there's some element of the group that sit, that commutes with everything other than the identity, right? I want to give you some examples, right? D4, its center is actually one and R squared. If we take the quaternion group Q8, its center, its center, of course, is the identity, but you also get negative one. Uh, these are two examples of non-abelian two groups, but their centers are non-trivial. This happens for every every P group there is. And this is a direct consequence of the class equation. So remember the class equation for any finite group, the order of that group will equal the order of its center plus a bunch of indices. In particular, this will be the indices of centralizers, uh, which this coincides with the order of uh, conjugacy classes, right? Well, since these are P groups, we can, we can specialize this, right? We know that P divides um, the order of G. In fact, P is the only prime that divides the order of G. Um, if we unravel these indices, as these are finite groups, right, the index here, G index some centralizer, where X, I is just some element, doesn't matter what it is really. Um, by Lagrange's theorem, since these are finite groups, this is going to be the order of G divided by the order of the centralizer here, for which Order of G is some power of P, so it's P to the N. Now you take away some of it because C of X I here is a subgroup of G. By Lagrange's theorem, its order divides order of G. Uh, and so that's an important thing to know about P groups is that by Lagrange's theorem, the subgroup of a P group is also a P group. So if you take these centralizers, they're also P groups themselves. And the P group divided by a P group is still gonna be a P group. So for P groups, quotients are also P groups. This is, this is the, you start to see why it's nice and simple to study P groups, right? Um, subgroups and quotients of P groups are themselves P groups. Therefore, 
we know that P must divide this index because P divides this thing right here. All right, the centralizer can't be everything. It's not the whole, it's not gonna, this isn't gonna be one because if G was equal to the centralizer, that actually means XI would belong to the center. So these things over here are those who are not central elements. So therefore this quotient is not one. Um, it's, but it's going to be some power of P, so P divides it. So P divides this thing. P divides this individual index, so it divides all the sums. So if we rewrite this class equation, we get that the order of Z, I'm just going to write that Z for a moment. Uh, this is going to be order of G minus the sum of all of these things, G index uh, CXI. So G divides the right-hand side here. So, so P divides the right-hand side. So P has to divide the center as well. So P divides the center, which means the center can't equal one because P doesn't divide that. So there has to be something in the center other than the identity. Um, now, it might not be much. I mean, like with these two examples right here, the center has order two, but that's the point. These are two groups. Two has to divide that. So these are small centers, but there is still something in there. And once the center is non-trivial, that can give you a lot of information. Now, of course, for an abelian group, um, the center is the whole group, so that doesn't say much. But this is very crucial for non-abelian P groups. Because the center is non-trivial, there's something in there. There's some central element. And in particular, the center is a normal subgroup. So you can use that, uh, uh, you can use that in various ways. I want to give you an application of this. So uh, this next this next corollary, the result we just saw, it's not a direct consequence of the of the class equation, but it's a corollary of the theorem we just proved. Why is having a non-trivial center useful? Okay, I claim that if you're a group of order p squared, you are necessarily abelian. Now, by the final the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, that means you either are z p squared, the cyclic group, or you're z p cross z p. That is, you're the elementary abelian group of order P squared. Those are the only two groups of order P squared up to isomorphism. All right, but that, that'll follow if it's abelian. Why is a group of order P squared abelian? Well, by the previous theorem, since this is a P group, right, your order is P squared, the center of that group is non-trivial. So it can't be, a, the order of the center can't be one. By, but by Lagrange's theorem, since the center is a subgroup, its order must divide P squared. The only other options are P and P squared. Now, in the case that the center has order P squared, that actually means that ZG is equal to G, and thus G is an abelian group, so we're done. So the only other case to consider is this one. Now, I want you to be aware that this is the hardest part of the argument, but it's actually sort of vacuous, right? Uh, because if a group is abelian, its center has to be everything. So this is not a possibility, but uh, we're still going to get... We're still going to get a billion here, even though this is sort of a vacuous case. It's sort of a weird logical head scratcher, but uh, just trust me, it's going to be okay. Uh, let's suppose that the center has order p. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the g. I'm going to take g and mod out by its center. The center is always a normal subgroup, and since the order of g is p squared, if you take a group of order p and divide it. In this situation, the order here is going to be P squared divided by P. So this is P. So this is the order of the quotient group. Uh, G mod out uh, ZG. Okay. Um, and so the quotient group G mod ZG has order P. But we've also previously seen in, in Math 4220 Abstract Algebra 1 that if a group has order of a prime, then it must be a cyclic group. So G mod ZG is isomorphic to ZP. So it's a cyclic group. The quotient is a cyclic group. Now, also in Math 4220, um, there was a homework exercise that was assigned that said that if a group mod out its, its center is cyclic, then it actually turns out the original group was abelian in the first place. So that will give us what we want here. Now, this was a homework exercise. This so I actually wanted to provide the solution to it. And it's a question I gave in the first semester. So if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you finished that semester, so you're not going to get a simple answer to that question. But let's actually look at the proof of that one. If G mod ZG is cyclic, then the group is abelian. Uh, so for simplicity, let's just call the center of the group Z, so I don't have to put all this extra notation when it's clear Z is the center here. And so we'll assume that G mod Z 
is cyclic. That means there's a single element that generates the entire group. Now, G mod Z, it's a quotient group, so the elements of G mod Z are cosets. A, Z is, a, is an element of that. It's some coset. And let's say that generates the entire thing. So there's some element of the group um, so that the coset A, Z generates the quotient group. Now, I want to show that G is abelian. Take two arbitrary elements of the group G. So because the quotient group is cyclic, the coset GZ is some power of AZ. So some power AZ to the N will give you GZ. But as this is coset multiplication, this is the same thing as AN to the Z. Similarly, there's some power M so that HZ is equal to AMZ. So we're going to use that to help us out here. So GZ and HZ can both be written um, as some power of AZ. Okay, since GZ is equal to A to the NZ, there has to exist some element of the center called Z so that G equals AN times Z. Similarly, H has to be factored as A to the M times Z prime, where Z prime also belongs to the center. So consider the following equation. If you take G times H, well, this is going to equal ANZ times AMZ prime. Redoing the parentheses, uh, let's look at just the product Z a to the m. Since z is central, this becomes a z a to the m z. Redoing parentheses again, we have a to the n a to the m. We have z times z prime. Well, this first expression here, it's just it's just the exponents of a here. By exponential rules, this becomes a to the n plus m, like so. But a to the n plus m is also equal to a to the m times a to the n. In particular, if you take the powers, two different powers of the same element, these things commute with each other. And as Z and Z prime are central elements, they commute with each other. So Z times Z prime becomes Z prime times Z. Redoing parentheses, uh, we now get A to the N times Z prime. Z prime is again central, so it commutes with A to the N. And redoing the parentheses one last time, you get A to the M times Z prime, A to the N. A to the M Z prime is H. A to the N times Z is G. And so we see that G H commutes and becomes HG. That then finishes this homework exercise, this claim here, for which noticing what's going on here, um, if you have a group, you mod out by its center, you get a, if that's cyclic, that quotient group, then the group itself is abelian. That finishes our claim. So coming back to the original statement here, G mod its center is a group of order P, which necessarily is isomorphic to ZP, so it's cyclic. So that means that G was originally abelian itself. That gives us what we want. And that finishes the proof. Now, like I said, that second case is sort of silly because we ended up with what we wanted, but that's impossible given the assumption. So technically that second case actually is vacuous. It's not possible, it leads to contradiction. But nonetheless, people often skip over because the contradiction you get was actually the thing you wanted in the first place. So we kind of skip over those details nonetheless. So I want to show you some theory behind um, P groups, right? There's only two P groups of order P squared, and they're the two abelian ones. And this is all a consequence of the class equation, uh, which has to do with the sizes of these consciousness classes. It's a pretty impressive result. And so that brings us to the end, of course, to lecture four about the class equation. Thanks for watching. If you learned anything, please hit the like uh, button for these videos. If you want to see more like this in the future, please subscribe to the channel. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments below, and I will gladly answer them at my soonest convenience.